Hello everyone. I hope you still have some energy because we will be talking about what matters and it's money and sales. <laughs> so uh, this panel discussion is going to be about the digital sales. Thank you very much about the introduction. I will leave the introduction to our speakers. Let's ju jump right into it. So please, uh, if you could introduce yourself, one, two sentences about yourself so I don't do any faux pas from, uh, straight from the beginning. Thank you for that introduction. And I think you gave some you know, uh, energy to the room. Uh, my name is Jovan Radnic. I am a product marketing manager at Logate. Uh, you just heard my colleague speak. And uh, CRM is one of our solutions that we offer, like off-the-shelf uh, software. And uh, my role here is basically like we stepped out of this outbound role of marketing and we're doing more of the inbound in the sense that we're not just looking to educate our clients and potential clients about the, the solutions we offer and the industry as a whole, but we are also learning. That's why we're here. Yeah, uh, I am Onur. Uh, I am responsible for uh, digital uh, sales and marketing department uh, in Turkey, ING Turkey. Uh, I have been almost uh, in banking sector uh, 17 years. And CRM, uh, of course, uh, for us, uh, really important uh, tools. Uh, and now uh, we improve ourselves uh, day by day. Uh, so. uh, hello, my name is Martin Schlibert. Uh, I'm from Latvia. I live in Lithuania. And my company, Flex Idea, out of Latvia, is also now currently operating in Poland. It's an invoice financing company, uh, super digital, 24 hours to the money, uh, best record 40 minutes maybe. And I have done a lot of sales, a lot of uh, digital sales, CRMs and stuff like that. So I think that will be interesting discussion today. Hey, Piotr Mieczkowski, Santander Bank Poland. I'm CPO, Central Product Owner in Santander for SMEs. I focus on acquisition, digital acquisition, later activation, loyalization of customers, and building some features for them in mobile application. Beautiful. Thank you very much for the introduction, gentlemen. First thing that I want to mention at the beginning, uh, listen and prepare any questions that you have. There will be five minutes, ten minutes at the end that you can ask them. And uh, you mentioned uh, this, this word uh, CRM. Right, uh, so let's start uh, with that. So CRM should help you understand and, uh, your customers. So whenever somebody comes up uh, to your branch, you already have some information, right? But what turns out uh, that uh, actually uh, this doesn't happen. So people come to the branches and uh, uh, the uh, specialist in the banks, the bankers doesn't know anything about them. This happens in four uh, out of six banks. So 60% uh, of the banks have implemented uh, CRM, but uh, in a lot of them is not working well. So my question on you is uh, how to implement CRM well and how to use it well. Thank you. Uh, well, I think it's funny that you actually mentioned that because my colleague actually had an experience like that in a Montenegrin bank. She went to a branch. And she spoke to the, the branch employee there who was basically like clueless about her. And uh, the process took like two or three more days because she couldn't have any details on uh, my colleague where she works, you know, things like that. Uh, sh they had to get it from the core. It took some time. She had to make some calls. It was a whole thing. Um, uh, you know, I certainly don't have uh, such a, an extensive uh, experience like the gentleman sitting on my left uh, in the banking industry. In fact, I've been at Logate for less than two years, actually. But uh, what I really noticed is like I like to talk to people in general. And I like to talk to um, people who know more about me, uh, more uh, than me about certain things. And uh, when it comes to the, the banking industry, when we were, uh, you know, discussing things like in marketing, Thing, you know, you always want to address the problem and first you need to figure out what the problem is. But usually when people talk about the problems, they usually name uh, some uh, consequences of the actual problem. So um, 
you would talk. Uh, I, I had a I had a, a pleasure to talk to many B level, C level executives from different banks, uh, many users of the CRM systems, uh, or people in sales departments, marketing departments, and, and etc. And we notice right away as a vendor that there is like this disconnect between what each department and each type of a decision maker, so to say, in the whole process wants out of the CRM solution. So user wants one thing, they want to have like a simple solution, they don't think about these things, oh, my supervisor is gonna need to control me, I need to complete all these reports, et cetera, et cetera. They just wanna do their tasks. On the other hand, you have their manager who's basically overseeing them, who wants to see the uh, the reports, who wants to see how, how well they're per performing, how fast they're performing their tasks, etc. So you have another type, and then you have like a guy or a boss above him, you know, uh, and uh, who wants uh, some more details and who wants, you know, profitability and things like that. So there's like this uh, issue of the alignment, like so each person has different goals and different needs, uh, but they'd often, uh, I have to say, they, from what we've seen, they often don't talk between themselves uh, openly about it. So that's why when we implement something according to like the tender, you know, as, as the tender requires, there is like a resistance uh, from the employees. And in a lot of the cases, they're not even sure why they're implementing a CRM. Why are they, you know, switching from, and I'm talking about some very basic ways of relationship management, like notebooks or Excel or uh, some old legacy systems that, uh, you know, freeze up when you open the, the, the window, uh, to like a, a modern CRM. And uh, they don't see the benefits and no one explains it to them. And uh, for me, it's like the starting point, you know, getting the onboarding process, I feel like starts when you publish a tender or even a little bit before. Mm. and you know, you get all of the people on board. And if you don't have that, I think it's also important to talk to the consultants that uh, have been in the industry f yeah. for a while and that can help you figure out what your needs are, what is realistic on the market and what you can do, because m maybe you're not aware of all the possibilities. No, the, totally, the, the, that makes sense. Uh, uh, maybe, Onur, uh, so what is your experience this? Because uh, uh, why and how to use the the CRM, you know, the yeah, uh, for the actually, implemented? Uh, when I think about what CRM is, uh, I imagine uh, a relationship manager who knows their customers very closely, who can offer them a personalized experience, who can establish uh, interactive dialogue rather than one-sided. Uh, actually, we can see in this approach personalization, segmentation, uh, campaign management, uh, all about CRM. Actually, all of us uh, imagine uh, as a tool uh, in which uh, this approach is, is digitalized. Uh, as ING Turkey, we uh, sell more than uh, 30,000 uh, SME products annually, our uh, CRM tools. And when we are uh, managing the uh, CRM, we have lots of uh, dimensions and rules. And maybe uh, I can uh, share some of them. Uh, Creating meaningful uh, interactive interaction with clients is really important for us because all of us uh, receive lots of SMS push call from everywhere. Uh, which of these do we read? Uh, what is uh, needed to be readable? Uh, these questions and answers are really important for our teams. Uh, and second, uh, developing uh, channels presentation skills uh, is important. Uh, because the channels uh, should support each other, but in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, some of them can speak customers' visual memory, some of them can speak their uh, numerical uh, memory. Uh, the other uh, modeling uh, is really important uh, when we are managing uh, CRM. Uh, customers touch us uh, from lots of points, uh, and we have lots of data. If we use them, uh, to create uh, uh, models uh, such as uh, prop propensity models, churn models, retention models, and CRM performancing uh, is going to well. Uh, as a result, uh, I think uh, CRM is all about customer uh, experiences uh, rather than uh, selling. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's what that's what I was just thinking, right? The, if I receive a push notification and it's just g generic message that doesn't apply to me at all, I'm like, I will just ignore it and maybe I will maybe even delete the app because it's uh, annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martins, uh, what is your experience with uh, CRMs and helping it, uh, you to sell? Uh, yeah, I have some experience with CRMs in, in different industries. Uh, I think your first question was uh, how to make the CRM project well. I think it's very easy. You just make it simpler, because uh, even when I was listening, guys, how you are implementing, you are totally right, correct, everything. But it was just so complicated. <laughs> I think that very often we overcomplicate CRM. Uh, we kind of managers come in and think that uh, employees need to fill 50 fields and stuff like that. Uh, but it's it's uh, it doesn't really work at the end of the day, and the efficiency is really bad. Uh, I think that you just need to have personalized stuff pulled up and to make it really easy on the employees, and then employees will be happy to fill, will be happy to use, and users will get the personalized experience. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's the thing. Uh, and uh, that's how, I think that's a key. It's uh, maybe a different opinion, but that's a key to make it actually simple, uh, and simple to use for both sides. Thank you. Uh, how about you? How is it working in Santander? Uh, I think that we have two interesting questions. First is how to build effective CRM and how to build not successful CRM. So I have seen a lot of models in uh, CRM models in the last years. So I think I have good recipe, recipe how to fail. So it is thinking about numbers. So it is thinking how many campaigns we are ready to implement for our RMs. It's a thinking how many communication we are ready to send to our customers. So this is not CRM, so this is spam, to be honest. So if you wonder sometimes why your RMs don't use CRM, probably is not useful for them. If you're thinking why your customers are not reading communication, probably it's not use it for them. So I think that CRM is more about value proposition, about context, about quality, more than how many we can send information to customers. So I think it is when we build CRM, it's good to start with campaigns with the best hit ratio. For example, predictions model, which you said, propensity, based on triggers, for example, to build a trust and engagement uh, at the beginning. And sometimes, probably, uh, we don't have so many advanced analytic tools, we don't have business intelligence teams. So maybe in that case, it's good to start with your RMs. Go there, ask them, how do you search customers? How do you talk about do, do, do you talk? and implement campaigns for rest of uh, sales channel. And in different way, you also go to the best RMs, but for example, with NPS high, and ask them, how do you build so long and strong relationship with customers and build campaigns for the rest of our sales? So I think that is a good idea to build engagement for your RMs trust in your customer's side. So I think that CRM is more about quality and value proposition on the end. Interesting. So so basically, first thing is that uh, we need to align internally in the bank uh, how to use it on many levels, right? We need to personalize it. We need to make it simple. Uh, and then we need to have a strong proposition in the end, right? Uh, but what to do with uh, MTCRM? So, um, Basically, my next question is how to get people into the CRM, how to acquire new customers. You know, nowadays, uh, if I don't have an account uh, and I get hit by a uh, YouTube ad or Facebook ad, I can send money. From not having the app, I can send money with the Revolut within five minutes. With SME, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more complex. You need to have more information. So how do you get the customers uh, digitally, easily, the SMEs? You're asking me, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, uh, I think uh, I, going back to what you said previously, actually, it was uh, really funny to me when you said that uh, getting those like spammy messages, you know, when that are not relevant to you. I remember like uh, a few months ago, I got this uh, message from my bank uh, in Montenegro, one of my banks, because I have multiple accounts. And uh, one of them was like, uh, spend your unforgettable summer in uh, the US on a work and travel program. And I'm like, I graduated like a few years ago. Why are you sending me this now? You know, it's so irrelevant. And then you cannot, in a way, honestly, you take you take the bank like less seriously because uh, you see that they don't really uh, personalize the experience to you at all. That it's not, re and then like every other message that I get, like of a promotional type, I'm gonna kind of ignore by default because I'm getting so many irrelevant messages from like different uh, sources, airlines, I don't know, uh, all these different companies to my email, to my to my SMS, uh, Viber, WhatsApp, whatever. Um, so I think when it comes to uh, acquiring new customers, first of all, you need to, I think, uh, address who the customer is and uh, segmentation i mean it's it's uh, today you cannot avoid it because uh, right now uh, marketing teams are running out of options like uh, basically advertising is becoming much more strict and uh, uh, just today i talked with someone on the topic of facebook or like meta implementing this ad free uh, subscription where people will be using that you know and it might be your customer using that so you cannot count on one channel you know where you can send the promotional offers videos whatever uh, in on youtube that already exists like you mentioned you you can already pay like for youtube uh, premium and is it, are those channels the right channels where exactly to acquire no, it, exactly i was going to say exactly like uh, well you know when when tiktok first appeared everyone was like it's for kids who are just uh, performing dances and it's uh, just stupid and then all of a sudden you had uh, uh, like really successful use cases of uh, accountants using it to like address uh, their target market. It made people uh, really uh, get to the core of marketing to say the least number of things in like a very limited time and to say things that are relevant. And you know, in the beginning it was bad because it's like you had this 30 second format and everyone thought, oh my God, how am I gonna pitch something in 30 seconds? But then people started doing it and now TikTok is like doing really well, like not just for like retail, but B2B as well. Yeah. What are your experiences, Jun? Uh, uh, well, uh, two points are uh, critical, I think. Uh, one is to be able to create a meaningful value proposition. Yeah. Uh, two is uh, to be able to uh, create uh, effective customer touch points. Uh, as ING Turkey, uh, we acquire more than 80% uh, uh, customers uh, through uh, from uh, digital channels. Uh, maybe uh, see, effective ones uh, are um, in digital journeys, uh, in business partnerships, where intensive customer touch points such as marketplaces, wholesalers, um, chambers, unions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can say second, uh, uh, digital marketing, content marketing, uh, uh, member get member programs. Yep. Uh, and third one, uh, last but I think it's first uh, uh, embedded finance and uh, embedded uh, payment options are really a uh, great way to acquire customers. Interesting. So it ju doesn't have to be just bombing, pe bombing people or with PPC, with paid ads, but yeah. you can actually kind of hide it and subtly mm -hmm. so provide the, yeah. the seamlessly provide exactly. the financial exactly. Exactly. service. What is your t take on it? Uh, on this okay uh, i think that in santander bank poland we have good experience in digital acquisition in last years i think that we acquired almost 200,000 customers through digital channels and based on that i think that we have three most important areas first is value proposition for me, it's something like promise that we have to give customers that we will be able to be with him today. When we will grow, we will be medium and large. 
and same times uh, it's a promise that we have some products maybe today dedicated only for corporate customers so we have to prove that we will, we will be able to be with customers that could be value added services of course the value for them is always if someone have branches with good advisors but we have to have some value proposition as owner said uh, uh, is good to start with maybe small target group yeah and later and later improve and improve so secondly uh, for me important is customer journey so how customer can open account and all touch points of course uh, it's obvious so for example in Santander customer can open bank account in branch can do it via selfie process like Revolut or ING also uh, he can open via video uh, conversation with advisor or even can order courier with documents ready to sign so we have a lot of ways to open this account through digital and third thing last not but least is marketing but thinking about digital acquisition i don't don't want to say that marketing on brand awareness is not important but crucial is performance marketing direct marketing in a digital acquisition martin so so the question was how to onboard smes <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so in Flexidia, it's 99.99 .99 online. There was one weirdo who wanted to come to office to sign agreement because he didn't believe that we are a real company. <laughs> uh, so, and it takes for SMEs five minutes, you know. They use the tools that the gentleman over here said, face recognition, ID, then it automatic AML, KYC, and sanctions, and all the other necessary places. Then we actually fetch up. SMEs, sign, signatory persons, we see that the person who is in the process is the signatory person. We do some magic with some uh, phone numbers and stuff, and then like sign agreements, that's it. Bank account opened. No, not bank account, but account opened, can finance invoices. Uh, when, when we are talking about uh, digital channels, uh, I will fight you, but I think that digital channels for SME doesn't work. Uh, I want to see some numbers from anyone that Facebook ads worked for you, or that TikTok ads worked for you, or YouTube ads worked for you. Uh, the places I have seen, conversion is maybe 1%. The companies that are more lucky maybe have conversion of 2%. And everyone is thinking that, no, it would be awesome if we made it to 5%. So um, in my life, uh, in various uh, SME-related projects, I have spent a huge amount of, on ads and I have never seen it work, and I'm actually going to fight anyone who wants to say yes, and we can have an awesome discussion about that and maybe learn something out of it. Yeah, I want to add, it's very interesting. I agree with you about Facebook and TikTok. So we have to find different touch points, and I'm sure it's not Facebook or TikTok. Let's talk. <laughs> I would say I would though say that it, they are important channels and not essentially in direct acquisitions, but that they play uh, a big role uh, in, as you said, like brand awareness and um, in general. I feel like it's not as simple as for individuals in general, like for for SMEs. But I think you'll see a growing number of Gen Z entrepreneurs that my colleague mentioned, uh, you know, being more impatient and being more, you know, prone. To, to these kinds of acquisitions. A, a quick one, I think the problem with SME acquisition is that it's really hard to target them yeah. because large, small companies are not really making LinkedIn profile. And I think on other platforms, it's really hard to pick it up, like who is actually an SME owner or director. And that's kind of, so yeah, it's like mixed and complicated. And I think in the platform, it's sometimes too late, unfortunately, to catch them. So yellow pages, you have to go through yellow pages. <laughs> now, uh, so you already mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, and touched upon it, uh, the the channels, right? That actually somebody came to your office and signed the paper physically. Uh, there are still people who wants to do it physically. That somehow, you know, may, maybe they are old-fashioned. They are scared. Uh, how do you deal with this? How do how do you become omnichannel, basically? Anybody? Uh, okay. So I think that omni-channel is about experience, to give customers the same experience in all channels. And I think that banks are quite good 
on that right now. Uh, and I think that we have three steps or three stages to be omnichannel. And I can give you an example from Santander and it will be a long process. So the first stage for us was when we have process only available in branch. And we discovered that our competition have process in digital and this process works quite good. So we moved to the second stage. So we implement processes in call center and uh, in digital. And later we find out it's not working. Why? Because we give the, the different experience. We expect different information. We expect different documentation. So then we figured out that we need uh, omni-channel, not multi, but omni-channel, and we will implement one credit process available in all channels. It means that you can start, proceed, and finish in mobile if you want, or branch, or call center, you can choose. But it means also that you can start process in branch, proceed later if you want in call center support, and at the end, if you want, you can uh, sign documents and agreements at home using mobile applications. So for me personally, this is real omni-channel, giving good experience for customers. I'm just here to mess you all up. Is it really necessary? Like, is it really necessary? Because uh, some of you say yes, but wait a minute. I have been working for government like 20 years and, and building e-services on a national level. And there is always this discussion about omni-channel because some pensioner in, in countryside will not be able to get an e-service. And then nor, like the actual very like innovative mode is we don't care. They will get a consultant to help them do it electronically and that's it. So we will get some other structure to be able, for example, in a bank, if you want omni-channel, but we just say mobile only, come to the branch, open your mobile, and get a consultant help you, and that's it. You will be mobile only. I'm actually asking, is it necessary? Who needs branches? Uh, who needs this omni-channel? Why we don't build just one channel and maybe additional services to get everyone into that channel? Aren't we overcomplicated things? Honor, uh, do you have any take on this, or are you uh, your one? Uh, yeah. Actually, a challenge. Uh, yeah, uh, creating omnichannel uh, where all clients in SME uh, can get experiences uh, is very important, I think. Uh, because uh, when we talk about omnichannel uh, from uh, touch transaction points in mobile to uh, to uh, customer uh, digital journeys in business partnerships. Uh, it's an ecosystem uh, that uh, can uh, orchestrate it with uh, visible uh, and I invisible uh, channels. I was going to say to address your point, uh, in Montenegro uh, and not just Montenegro, Serbia, Croatia even, um, Bosnia, there's a ridiculously high number of young people, like we're talking between 18 to 25, who don't have a credit card yet. They will go to the branch and they will go there to pay like their bills and stuff. And we were like talking about it and one of the guys at the conference told me like, I wonder why does not someone like, you know, coach these like employees of the bank to just go outside with their M banking app and just show them how it works. And he's like, that would be the best advertising because like, uh, they use billboards, they use uh, TV ads. Like, People 18 to 25, I tell you, they don't really watch TV and they don't pay attention to billboards. So TikTok or Facebook would help there, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but uh, I think it also depends on the quality of those experiences, you know, because uh, for example, uh, I had situations uh, even in the US when I lived there that I had to go to the branch like uh, uh, my account was in Wells Fargo I had to open it in person and then I remember I had to like I don't remember what, we, what it was uh, but there was like some transaction issue or something and I had to go to the branch like in the US where you have like all 
competitive a lot of competitive banks and they they have all kinds of innovations there and all of that I still had to go there like so the quality of the experience was really bad so it was easier for me to go to the branch because it gave me like this reassurance that I will talk to the real person and that I will you know stand there until they solve my problem you know uh, meanwhile I can, you know, stand on the phone uh, and wait in a queue and be there for like two hours and I won't even know if that person is like working on my problem or they're just, you know, uh, holding my me in the line. So it, it's also like the trick there. And I also saw some research um, that was done globally that uh, the Gen Z actually has more reassurance uh, 44 percent or something like that has a more reassurance when there's like an, a physical bank branch that they, they can go to uh, when it comes to choosing their banking provider i just want to add that i agree with you about digi uh, mobile only but i think that we have to remember about digital maturity in regions in countries we, we have so it's good but not for each of us not yet, yes. A adaption issues. Yes. That's what I was just thinking about, uh, right? So I've got a dad, he's 65, he's got a small uh, business, he's kind of innovative, but you know, he doesn't have a, such a much, uh, a lot of money, right, in his business. So is it even customer that you want to serve if he's not able to use the phone? You know, so that would be the question. Maybe, uh, uh, is there somebody from the audience who would like to challenge our speakers with some question? I have one question uh, in the reserve, but cameraman? No, no, you don't. No. Okay. So uh, we already touched upon on it as well. The basically question of uh, embedded finance, uh, contextual uh, banking. You know uh, how to basically sell something in the right time for to the right people on the right spot. So we uh, we spoke about it that embedded finance. What are the other channels that uh, you can? embedded financial products to, again to anybody okay uh, it's the first area for us uh, we are learning already uh, but uh, to in uh, since 2015 uh, almost 30 uh, thousand uh, 3000 uh, merchants we have bmpl uh, solutions uh, for uh, individual customers and uh, we see, uh, we can see their uh, effects uh, positively in transaction ways or uh, acquisition ways. Uh, but uh, it's still uh, in baby steps uh, in Turkey. Uh, now uh, we are, uh, we should uh, improve our uh, skills uh, in embedded uh, finance. Uh, because we, I think three years later, it is the main channel uh, when I call a customer. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, you can embed the finance in many di various places, right? Like invoice, for example, financing, you can embed in e-invoice system. You can embed in some, some logistics uh, brokerage exchange where you get cargos and you just say, I want also money right away. You can embed it in like an um, online store, to B2B store or something. You can embed it in a bank, like a big brother that maybe doesn't want to deal with certain SMEs and kind of pass it over to FinTech. I think about embedded finance, however, it's very interesting, I think, is this technological um, readiness of banks, I think, to do it. Because I, I had a conversation in Poland with a bank that was really having this innovative department to do innovations and stuff. And then they said, yeah, it's really awesome. We would like to do it. Our queue for IT is one year. And I was thinking, you know, in one year, <laughs> there is no point doing it. Maybe the world will be different, you know. So I think um, uh, we somehow need to solve that in embedded finance a lot. You know, like how to get it quick. And, and most likely also when you start embedded finance, you will need to do some testings like piloting, A-B testing, like different experiences. So technically, both partners most likely should be ready to really adapt quickly and change quickly. And I think that's the biggest issue uh, in the banking uh, sector now, if they want to have embedded finance as a partner. And I believe that banks that will be faster can actually win a lot. Yeah, I think that embedded finance is a future, or maybe might be the future. So right now it is a, a big opportunity for SMEs. You know, they can have some 
financing products, insurance, and then can combine to sell processes that they have in e-commerce. So this is opportunity for them. I think this also opportunity for banks to have fast products, easy from uh, fintechs. But I think that it is it might be so easy and quick because it's still not regulated areas, so like BNPL or different products. So I hope I hope it will be still, but we have to uh, wait. I personally see a lot of um, you know benefits in connecting the non-banking. Uh, players with the banks, uh, so not even fintechs, but um, essentially what happened in in the telecom industry to, to draw a parallel is like uh, they're also undergoing some massive changes right now and they're having to change the business model. And I know there, that Telecom Romania, for example, what they do is like they partner with, uh, with a marketing agency and they provide um, SEO services for um, their biggest clients or, or no for the SM, for the SMEs actually and it's a great way for them to like onboard new clients because when you're starting a business or something like that you don't know ev any everything about every aspect of the business or you may have like marketing people but they need some help with the SEO or something like that and it became you know uh, a partnership there and it became like this new offer like uh, so i think in the in the banking industry essentially i think that there's going to be a lot of collaboration with uh, us as vendors uh, to to bring these uh, solutions to the market, uh, but also to connect it to their existing partners, whether it's uh, airlines, whether it's like uh, you know retail stores, because uh, that's like the most uh, used uh, use case for retail. Uh, and um, also on the other hand, like uh, Martin's mentioned, like the supply chain financing as well. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, uh, the audience as well. That was a beautiful build-up for the next part of uh, our uh, program, the rewards. Right, Olena? Now it's break. Thank you very much.